go ahead and take out your Bible uh, and open it to Mark chapter 1. We're going to be in Mark chapter 1 for three weeks. Okay, uh, so you're going to be eating good. And uh, I want to let y'all know how to read this book in the right way. All right. One of the things that you're going to, how many of y'all struggle with ADD, ADHD? Some of y'all may be misdiagnosed and never diagnosed, but you're like, as you look at the symptoms, you're like, oh yeah, I totally had that. My teachers will tell me Chad had ADD, ADHD, and a little bit of the devil too. All right. And so if you, str- if you have ADHD or ADD, This is the gospel for you, son, all right? Uh, Because here's some things I want you to learn about early on in the uh, the book of Mark. The book of Mark, write this down, is a book of action, all right? I like to call the book of Mark a gospel for, for dudes because it talks more about what Jesus did than what he taught, all right? For example, this is is a cool part about uh, the book of Mark. Book of Mark, there are 18 recorded miracles and only four parables, all right, it's, it's, it's really cool about that. And why? Because this was a gospel that was written to, uh, to a Greco-Roman audience. These were people of action, okay? And it explains some Jewish customs, but it omits the genealogies and the birth narratives. They're like, you know what? I don't need to know who begat so-and-so. Let's get away from all that jazz. All of a sudden, you see in Mark chapter 1, you see that Jesus has already, has already uh, healed somebody and, dr- and cast out a demon, all right? They're not waste, wasting no time here. It begins rather abruptly, which we'll see here in just a second, and it moves fast from one episode to another. What you're going to discover about the book of Mark, it is like drinking from a fire hose, all right? And for those of you that more than likely have a heavy foot when you're driving, you're going to love the book of Mark, all right? The reason why is that did you know that in the book of Mark, the word immediately appears 42 times, all right? We all have that one friend who hyper-focuses on a word. Some of y'all may have have a friend that says literally all the time. All right? You know, somebody was telling me the uh, story the other day. Like, he literally grabbed such and such. And I was like, well, I didn't think he figuratively grabbed it. And, you know, and of course, they called me a smart aleck. But So everybody has a word that they hyper-focus on. And Mark's is immediately. All right? And Mark was written in present tense because he wants to convey that Jesus is not some historical figure. He is a living reality who still addresses us today. From the very first sentence, we see that there's a crisis and that the status quo has been broken. Jesus has come on the scene and now anything can happen. This was written to men of action and Mark wants us to see that Jesus was a man of action. Can I get a little bitty amen? And because Jesus is a man of action, he is coming on the scene and he demands decisive action on our parts. The first uh, half of the book of Mark talks about Jesus' mighty miracles and his authority over sickness and demons. But the second half of of Mark's gospel talks about the cost of discipleship. In other words, he's he's, uh, foreshadowing what Jesus is going to do for us on the cross. And he's telling us this, following Jesus is going to cost you something. Ladies and gentlemen, may I just let you know something. Jesus did not carry his cross so that we would not have to carry ours. All right? And so if you, get, if you happen to be turning on the television one night and there's some happy-go-lucky preacher in a $10,000 suit and, and a $100,000 uh, uh, Rolex talking about, when you follow Jesus, your biggest dreams will come true. And you'll never have any problems. Everything's going to be carefree. Can I give you some, uh, some free advice? If you are at that man's church, keep one hand on your wallet and the other one on your wife. Because if he'll lie about Jesus, he'll try to steal from you, all right? Jesus did not carry his cross so that we wouldn't have to carry ours. But Jesus said, let me carry my cross first so I'll show you how to carry ours. We are not guaranteed a pain-free life, ladies and gentlemen. But Jesus said, I'll show you how to carry it. And guess what? Not only will you go through life, uh, even sometimes uh, with some challenges, but you'll go through it with joy. All right? Let me tell you about uh, another thing about Mark. It was written between 55 and 65 A.D. There's some really interesting things to note here. Because at this point in history, if you, for those of us who are historians in the room, <laughs> Christian history between 55 and 70 A.D. is very, very bloody. Following Jesus is more than likely going to cost you your life. If you applied for membership at one of the early New Testament churches, it was this. Uh, And your questionnaire, it would say, do you have a thick cranium? 
Because more than likely they're going to bash in your head with the rocks. Do you have a fear of lions? More than likely you're going to... And so it was not easy to join the church, and that's why everybody wanted to join the church. Because it was powerful, it was awesome, people's lives were changed. And so Tertullian, the great historian, wrote that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. In 64 AD, we see historically there was the fire of Rome. Nero blamed the Christians, and thus began the Neronian persecution. And by the way, if you thought that he was prejudiced just against uh, Christians, Nero also killed his mom, his stepbrother, and his two wives. All right, so he was an equal opportunity murderer. All right, and so he fed Christians to lions, he tied them to stakes, covered them with oil, and used them as human torches. All right, in 70 AD, the Roman general Titus seizes Jerusalem and he burns the temple to the ground. Now, watch this when he goes. There's a gold room, the treasury room. has all this gold and everything. It has stuff hanging on the walls. And the fire gets so hot that the gold begins to melt into the cracks of the walls. And so guess what they did? They had to go ahead and they had to tear the temple apart brick by brick. Perhaps you've read the story in the Bible where Jesus walks past that massive temple and he says, Hey guys, uh, let me just tell you something about this great temple that y'all love so much. One day, not one brick's going to stand on top of one another. And ladies and gentlemen... The Roman general Titus made sure that not one brick st uh, stood on top of one another. You know why? Because they were, uh, they were uh, prying it apart to scrape the gold out. What Jesus tells us is going to happen will happen. Amen. History backs this up. So when we read Mark's gospel, we have to read it by the light of these two fires historically. The fires of, uh, of, of people being burned to death and the fire of the temple. Okay? So knowing all this persecution... We would think that Mark is like, okay, everybody's dying right now. So as I write this story, I probably just need to wade into the water a little bit, all right? Mark does just the opposite. He cannonballs into it, all right? This is what, so watch what it says in verse 1. It says this, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Some of you are like, what's so, what's so bad about that? All right, let me explain to this. And the best way to understand it is a little bit of the Greek, all right? Uh, the, the word good news in the Greek is the word evangelion, all right? Let me give you the definition of it. Evangelion is the word, it means news that brings joy of an event that has changed things in a meaningful way, all right? So whenever there was a war or something, and your, uh, let's say your country won the war, they, would, they didn't have Twitter and they didn't have the way to get the word out, all right? So they would send people with the good news, we've won the war, and guess what the people that they sent with the good news about them winning the war was, the, what their names were? They were called evangelists, okay? Evangelion, evangelists. And so evangelists were sent out after the Greek battles of Marathon and Solnus where they defeated Persia. These evangelists traveled the whole world, the whole known war saying, we have won the war, you are no longer slaves, but free. Okay? Evangelion was also used in 9 BC to describe the birth announcement of Caesar Augustus. It was printed on coins calling Augustus, let me tell you, it said the good news, Augustus, the son of God. All right? Now, how many of y'all are military? Uh, uh, you don't have to raise your hand, but we all love our military, right? What I love about our military is, is this, they have a lot in common with the book of Mark because they live by the motto, bluff, B-L-U-F. For those of you that don't know what bluff means, it means this, bottom line, up front. How many of y'all appreciate that? I, I'm kind of one of those guys, all right? In other words, they say, give me the most important details first. Mark does this by saying, here's the real news. Jesus is the Son of God. He won the war, and you have been set free. And as he does this, he is declaring a spiritual coup d'etat against Caesar. He's poking the bear. He is speaking truth to power. Mark uses the very word that Rome used to deify the emperor, and he gives it to Jesus. We are only one sentence into the gospel of Mark, and he has already dethroned Caesar. So when word got out about what Mark wrote, guess what all of the, uh, the Christians did? Okay, it's time to update my will. <laughs> because we are going to die and die with pain. All right? Mark jumps right into the face of Rome. He jumps into the face of the Jews who rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And anyone who believes anything else, he says this, Jesus Christ is the Messiah and the Son of God. Deal with it. And so 
He's saying, this is the real good news, everybody. This is the evangelion. Everything everybody else says is fake news. Any follower of Jesus that read this, they swallowed really hard and said, yep, we're going we're gonna to die. All right. What I like so much about Mark is Mark is the only gospel writer who uses the word gospel at the beginning of his work. Why? Because he is saying, this is only the beginning of the good news. Verse 1. He is declaring war on the emperor. He is saying, guys, this is how it begins. Bottom line up front, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. How many of you like guys that will get to the stinking point? For the next eight verses, we see that Mark shows that John the Baptist is the one who would prepare the way of the Lord. So he is equating Jesus as God Almighty right here. Mark roots Jesus as deeply as possible into the historic religion of Israel because he is showing everyone that Christianity is not some new thing. It is the fulfillment of all the, what the Jewish prophets spoke about. So now in the next event we see in chapter 1 is, is very important for many of us for next week. And it says this, at that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Why did Jesus go to John? Here's what I want us to see. For those of us who may be on the fence about getting water baptized, I, I kind of make this standing joke every time when people, I'm a little bit hesitant to be, be baptized, PC. I know you had a traumatic Marco Polo experience in a swimming pool where somebody <laughs> like held you underwater too long. We're not going to do that to you, all right? And there's some people be like, you know, I got baptized as a baby. This does not compete against that. This completes that. When you got baptized as a, as a baby, it was your parents' desire that you would one day have a faith of your own. So there's water baptism, there's infant baptism, and then there's believer's baptism. This is a good thing. Well, I don't want to tick God off by getting baptized again. What? Why, why would God be ticked off at you, if, uh, you, uh, you know, obeying him? All right? It doesn't matter. Jesus walked 80 miles to get baptized by John. I think we can be over here in nice warm water next week and show God that we mean business about our life. It's the next step where you and I, we go public with our faith. We go over and we go forward by going under. All right? Now, here's the, what's so cool about this. The reason why he walked 80 miles to get baptized is amazing. Because in this area where John was baptizing people is where some of the greatest transitions in Jewish history took place. This is the exact same place where Elijah handed off his ministry to Elijah. And then this is where Joshua brought the people into the promised land. This particular geography was crucial to Jesus' identity as the Son of God. And that is why many of you, this is exactly what you'll do next week when you get baptized. You are saying here from here on out, my life is transitioning into a new direction. Amen? So look at the uh, next verse here. It says this. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love and with you I am well pleased. Now let's break, that, break this down smooth for you, all right? That word heaven being torn open is the Greek word schizo, all right? Mark uses schizo at the beginning of his gospel and at the end of his gospel. Why? Because he's trying to match two events here, all right? He is matching Jesus' baptism and his death. Heaven was being torn open at his baptism, and the temple curtain that we talked about last weekend was also torn open. In all of Jewish writings, this is also a really peculiar place where the, there's only one other place where the Spirit of God is referred to like a dove, all right? Any guesses? Genesis 1-2, all right, said this, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Now, that's our interpretation of the Scriptures. But uh, the Hebrew Scriptures that Jews during Mark's times translated it this way, the Spirit of God fluttered above the face of the waters like a dove. Now, notice with me, this is really cool. There are three parties that were active in the creation of the world. God, God's spirit, and God's word. These same three are present at Jesus' baptism. The father is the voice, the son is the one getting baptized, and the spirit is the one who's fluttering like the dove. All right, so the same three that were in creation are now at the place of the redemption of the world, beginning now with the arrival of the king who is part of that triune God. All right? And what does the father say to the son? I love this. He says this, you are my son, I love you, and I am pleased by you. 
Now, here's what's important to note. The only thing that Jesus had done at that point in his life was make furniture. All right? So, now, don't get me wrong. There was no table come out of, come out of the, uh, the wood shop at Nazareth that was, had crooked legs. All right? That was the finest uh, furniture that money could, uh, could buy because the Son of God was shaping that furniture. Everything he did, he did, uh, he did as all things well is what they said about him, right? So that was, that was good furniture that happened. But here's what, what's important for us to know is that God's love for Jesus and his love for us is not based on our performance. He just loves us. What do I got to do to please God? Breathe. He just loves you. are his kid, all right? He loves us unconditionally, and Jesus was going to need to know this. because uh, He needed to hear this for the season he was about to head into because look at what the next two verses says this. At once, or Mark's favorite word, immediately, <laughs> the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days. Being tempted by Satan, he was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. Now, some of us were sitting there, man, God, he got sent into the wilderness. But you know what? There are some of us right now that we may be in a wilderness, okay? What's a wilderness? It's a dry and barren place. It's a place where we find ourselves relationally, emotionally, and spiritually empty. The wilderness is a place of temptation. The wilderness is where we don't have resources to fall back on. The wilderness is a place of nightmarish danger, and by the way, what's so cool about Mark's gospel of this, Mark's gospel is the only one that talks about wild animals. He's saying this was a terrifying place to be, all right? But he also said that God sent angels to protect Jesus. Now, notice with me. Now, this is, this is, this is PC talking to you. This is pastoral talk. I want you to know this, that God didn't send angels to help Jesus say no to the devil. He sent angels to protect him from the wild animals, all right? Here's what we got to understand. God does not want his children to be robots. He wants us to choose him, and he's not just going to press play. Whenever you and I are in a place, a place of uh, being, being tempted and all kinds of other stuff like that, God will say, hey, look, I'm with you. You know what to do, but I ain't going to make the choice for you. Amen. Now, listen to me. There's some of us right now who are like, I just wish God would speak on this matter. He already has on his word, and we need to obey. Now, God was not about to make up his mind for him, but guess what he did do? He kept the wild animals from him. And no matter what we face, that against those wild animals are the angels of God. And God will protect us from what is trying to tear us apart, and he will do that by providing a way of escape. Some of us, the best way to be able to get out of a situation is to walk out of the situation. Some of us, I wish God would deliver me. He did. Get out of it. Don't you be going up in no, no bar knowing you struggle with alcohol. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. Some of us right now, we wonder where God is, and we're walking where angels don't even dare to tread. We're going in and putting our place of a place of temptation and saying, God, deliver me. He said, I'm going to deliver you. Get out. Quit acting like a fool. But the good thing about God is the Spirit of God will follow you wherever you go. He'll sit down next to that bar stool beside you and chide you and tell you, you don't have no business in this place. Get out of here. Come on. Let's get back to, get back to where you were meant to be all along. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus. Did he get out of the wilderness? Yep. And what was the result of the wilderness? Look at the next verse. It says this. After John was put in the prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of, the, of God, saying, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Now watch this. Jesus' first sermon is basic, but it encompasses everything. Can I let y'all know something? Knowing what God wants for your life is not some major mystery. Can I let y'all know, there is no such thing as a Bible code that only a few people that understand Hebrew know about. Again, I put those type of people in the same category of the guy that was happy, happy, joy, joy, give me your money guy, all right? Why? Because here's what you got to understand. One of my, uh, my roommates here is sitting on the front, uh, front row. We got taught this in Bible co uh, college, me and Tim and Dan Astudo and my wife and all of us. Here's what we got to understand about Scripture. In Scripture, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. There is no secret Bible code that only a select few people know about. The things that we really need to know about God are not hidden. God's Word completely reveals them. So don't be led by confusion by people who are just trying to, trying to take your money. 
That's foolishness. A couple of years ago, there were, there were people that said, hey, there's this Bible that's producing oil. And they went all over the, uh, all over the nation. It was clear oil. And people were like, oh, my gosh, what was happening? Later on, they did a run on the thing. It was clear motor oil. There were people like, hey, I think I'm going to go see that Bible leaking oil. I was like, why don't you got to go there? How about read your Bible? This is how we build our life. Signs and wonders. Yeah, the, I, could God do it? Yeah, but if he wanted to, wanted to do it, wouldn't there be a pattern to follow? God is not some God that's going to lead you and get his people to act weird. All right? God wants us to know that the main things are the plain things. Some people will come to me from time to time. Hey, PC, what do you think about what prophet so-and-so says about the election? I'm like, well, we'll see. All right? The Bible tells us don't despise prophecy, so don't despise prophecy. But here's what we've got to understand about biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy is only made true in its fulfillment, not in its declaration. So if prophet so-and-so says something and it don't come to pass, is prophet so-and-so going to get on Twitter and apologize? Because we didn't see a lot of that about four years ago. And so here's what we've got to understand. When we get some of these things, we're like, let's weigh it against God's word. Hey, cool. If it happens, cool. But biblical prophecy is made true in its fulfillment, just, not just because somebody says something, right? God doesn't want his people gullible. Jesus' first sermon begins telling us what God has done. What does he say? The time has come and the kingdom of God is near. And the next thing he tells us to do are the things that we must do. He's talked about what God has done. Now he talks about what we must do. He says this, repent and believe the good news. All right? What does repent mean? Repent means to reverse course. When we repent, we move from doing the things that God hates and we start doing the things that God loves. And not only uh, that, do we see that Mark mentioned the word good news twice, here's what we got to understand what separates Christianity from all the other religions. All the other religions are philosophies and good advice. Christianity is news. All right? Where the news is this. This is what's been done. This is how Jesus lived and died for you so that you can connect with God. That is our news. Philosophy may inspire us, but does it produce what the, does it produce what the people of Greece felt when the heralds told them that they were free from war? No. When they heard good news, burdens fell off of them. They said, you're not a slave anymore. You've been set free. That sounds like good news to me. Not just, hey, if you do this, you, you reach another level of enlightenment. Who needs enlightenment whenever your soul is rotting? When our spirit needs to be connected with God, that is good news. We, we, this is what, what separates us from everyone else. This is the first 15 verses of the book of Mark, and it's like drinking from the fire hose, and I love it. <laughs> and here's how we're going to wrap it up today. What you're, what you're going to appreciate most about the, uh, about the book of Mark is when we research the author. Who's Mark? Mark was a disciple? Nope. He wasn't a disciple. He was a first generation Christian who was an associate of Peter and later on Paul and Barnabas. This gospel was told to him by Peter. All right? So notice with me, you'll see this as you read. There is no account of Mark where Peter is not there. Mark is just transcribing what Peter told him. All right, so here's the reason why everything is so in your face. Because if you want to know how Peter would talk to others about Jesus, read Mark. Because he's talking through Mark. There's so much action, and it's in such a short period of time, and we see incredible boldness. Why can we appreciate this? Because when you and I see Mark mentioned in Scripture, we will see that Mark as a young minister was anything but bold. Peter, loud, outspoken, his uh, uh, mouth wrote checks, his butt couldn't cash, constantly, all right? And for our benefit, Mark puts his failure out there for all to see. That's the leader you want to follow. Can I tell you, the stories that I have that connect the most with you guys is not whenever PC won the big game. Uh, the stories that connect uh, with you the most is whenever I say, dude, I freaking blew it. Almost ruined my life. These are the things that connect with people. You know why? Because failure is common. Mark puts his failure out there for all of us to see. When Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, Mark writes about how one young man was so scared that he fled naked into the night. Only Mark's gospel records this. Do you know why? Because this is an autobiographical 
reference. Mark was the naked guy that ran away when the heat was on Jesus. But it wasn't the only time he'd run away. Later on, we read in the book of Acts that Mark abandoned Paul and Barnabas at the beginning of their first missionary journey. He said, I can't take it anymore. And he just, he just tucked tail and run. Paul so much completely lost face in him and he refused. Later on, he was like, man, my bad. I didn't want to be able to do that. And Paul goes, go be a missionary with somebody else, partner. I ain't got time for your foolishness. You are immature and you got, you got authority issues. Go do your own thing. Paul was a crusty old fart, wasn't he? <laughs> but thank God, listen to me. Mark didn't let failures define his life. He overcame them. So much so that old crusty old Paul, whenever he's sitting in the member team prison waiting to get executed, guess what he tells Timothy in a weak and frail voice? Hey, hey, do me a favor. Bring Mark to come see me. Because he's useful to my ministry. Failure didn't define him. We see that God used a man who was scared of his own shadow to write the boldest of all the gospels. And just like Mark, our failure doesn't have to define us either. Can I let you know, every week we have something on Thursday night called Celebrate Recovery. And there are people, and God is moving so strongly in that ministry. It's one of the fastest growing ministries that we have. I met Baymanette regularly around 100 people every week. Theirs is on Friday night, ours is on Thursday. You know what, what's so beautiful about it? Is that you can have what they call a freedom chip. If you've come and you've relapsed, if you've used or you've done something, you know, because this is not just for alcohol and drugs. This is also for other type of hangups. If you're there and you got a bad temper and you freaked out, cussed out your coworker or something like that, you relapsed, all right? This is for all kind of hurts and hangups. And guess what happens at the beginning of it? It's one of the most beautiful things you could ever see. I, the first time I was ever there, I'm fighting back tears, and I said, I will give my life to this, to this church. Because you see people that say, hey, who, who wants to celebrate 30 days clean? And there, there'll be somebody come up there and they'll get a chip. Who wants to celebrate 60 days clean? There another one, everybody applauds. And who wants to celebrate 90? Everybody applauds. And then all of a sudden, you hear somebody say, now, who'd like to pick up a freedom chip? That means they, rela they relapsed. And then all of a sudden, you'll see somebody that'll just walk up there and he's dealing with so much shame and that's the one that gets the loudest applause. When you go through Celebrate Recovery, guess what happens? When you're being tempted and when you're feeling like you're a failure and all the voices of your past and all those demons come pulling on you, you can call one of your brothers or sisters and you'll have 10 of them in your living room within a half an hour. Show me another ministry that does something like that and it'll change the world. You know why? Because we're all failures when we, go, when we compare our life to Jesus, aren't we? When we go and we say, hey, there were times when I should have been bolder. Should have been bolder. There's some of us that be like, I don't know what happened. Had a gal in between services, well, love like a daughter. She said, PC, her life's been going through agony these last six months. And she said, PC, I was clean for 15 years. And man, I just... I just got obliterated drunk. And she and I, I, was, I was like, hey, I, I understand. You've gone through a lot. And she said, when I finally sobered up, I said, God, I cannot live like this. This is not the answer. What do I need to do? And she, you can tell she was, she's been in this church for a while. She said, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, get your butt to church. And she goes, and I did. And she goes, and I went to celebrate recovery the other night. I got me a freedom chip. I, I said, I don't think I've ever been this proud of you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you're here this week and you, and you screwed up or you're carrying screw-ups from years ago, the devil loves to work on reruns. Do you know why? Because he doesn't have anything new to work with. It means you're growing. I remember one time whenever I was talking with a guy, he came, got saved. Next week he comes into church. Man, he looks horrible. He is just so devastated. I said, what happened? 
He said, man, I thought I gave my life to Jesus last week. And man, I, I did drugs three times this week. And I was like, okay. I said, all of a sudden, he looked at me and said, how many times did you normally do it? He goes, dude, about 100? I was like, oh my God, you got saved. He's like, what do you mean? I said, you went from 100 to 3? The Spirit of God's on you, boy. And he was like, oh, and all of a sudden, those tears began to come. Those hands came up because that is what the gospel does. It sets us free. Ladies and gentlemen, just like Mark, our failures don't have to define us. God wants to write his good news through us so that we can become the people we were always meant to be and so the Gulf Coast will be safe.